Hello, and welcome to another edition of WIF's Laptop Cinema Club. This is the series that brings you intimate conversations with the talented creatives behind the media you love. I'm Ebony Adams, and I'm incredibly excited to bring you another peek into the making of Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, a heart song of a show about a brilliant young computer coder with the magical ability to hear people's innermost feelings and desires through music. In this world, strangers, friends, coworkers, and family sing their wants, hopes, and fears to her, all unknowingly. The series is packed with a powerhouse cast of performers, including lead actors Jane Levy and Mary Steenburgen, and is led by a team that includes producer, director, and choreographer Mandy Moore. All three join us today. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so as traction builds for the 2021 Emmy race, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist is justifiably in contention for a host of categories, from acting to design to music supervision. So I want to talk about your hopes for the show, the way that it's grown and changed over the course of the past two seasons and things that you're looking forward to. Um, and I'd like to start with Jane. So by the end of season one, so many things have happened in Zoe's life, some thrilling, some devastating. Can you tell us where does season two pick up and what excited you about the story you saw in the scripts for this latest season? Season two starts about six-ish weeks after the death of Zoe's father, uh, Mitch Clark. And this season, you know, season one was about the journey leading up to saying goodbye to someone. And season two is the journey after you have to say goodbye. And you know, all of it is grieving. There is many different stages of grief. Everyone's grief looks differently. Uh, our show is created in honor of our showrunner's father who passed away from the same neurological condition that Mitch passed away from. And so a lot of the show is based off of his personal experience. Um, so this season was about how do we move through the grief after somebody passes? How do we carry on? And for Zoe this season, it was a bit messy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she has an episode where she takes in a drug. We don't know what drug that was. Um, she is confused in love life. She's scared. She is trying to power through and just be really good at her job. Um, so I was excited this season to just, you know, continue collaborating with the people you just mentioned. You know, I, we wrapped at the end of March this year and I've now had two months of space and I was, you know, right now I'm actually not in the country. I'm on a vacation and I don't know why I'm going like this. I'm on a vacation. <laughs> um, and I find that when you're on vacation, you really are, are able to have some space. And I've been thinking and reflecting a lot on what we just made and, you know, hearing you say that this show is in contention for awards, which is just so amazing that we've built this thing that people respond to. And I'm just, I'm having a moment where I'm incredibly proud of our show. We pull off a lot in one, in 42 minutes. And I love Mandy and Mary so much. And, you know, I just feel really lucky to, to be a part of this. Yeah. So Mary, some of the most beautiful, quiet moments of the show are delivered through your profoundly expressive performance. What have you found most gratifying about this latest season? Well, first of all, what a kind thing to say. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a quiet part, you know, and, um, and I, I've thought about it a lot because I was kind of close to the age that, um, that Zoe and Jane are when my own father passed away. And I remember that my mother instantly became, um, she was a fabulous mother and she, she instantly tried to help my sister and I heal. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at moments like that, sometimes you go back to being the kid and you don't totally think about what the hell is she feeling? She lost her partner of like 40 years. And um, so now I'm playing this character who's really in some ways my mother, 
but I too have been in a very long marriage, you know, and like anybody in a long marriage, you put your toe into the pain of that possibility every once in a while to just see, could I survive, you know? And so this, for, for Maggie, it's a question of who even am I, you know? And it's particularly been um, an honor to explore it with our whole cast, but the, these two women in particular, because they're very soulful and um, we, even in the smallest scenes about a pair of earrings that, you know, Mitch gave Zoe on her 16th birthday or whatever, I go into that scene knowing that I have the deepest of partners to play with. And, um, and every, you know, every time we do a dance, Mandy works from, starts from a place of the heart. It eventually is translated into movement and dance, but it never starts there. It always starts uh, from your heart. So it's been um, scary for me to do this um, in lots of ways. It's in every single way outside my comfort zone, um, but I'm honored to, to have done it and um, to work with these amazing people. That's fantastic. And that's a wonderful segue into my question for you, Mandy, which is, can you talk a little bit about the process of working with Austin Winsberg, the showrunner, with the writers of the show, with Jen Ross, the music supervisor? How does, you know, a musical number, which is, you know, at the heart of the show, the heart of an episode, how does that go from page to screen? <laughs> well, do you have like 10 hours to talk about it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated process, but one that I feel like we've started to streamline in a way that makes it possible for us all to shoot this episode in eight days. You know, it, it's insane. Like Jane was saying that it's pretty crazy what we pull off in 42 minutes in eight days. So, um, you know, I know that Austin very early on uh, talked a lot about making sure that the clearance of the music was not an issue, you know? And so he brought on Jen, uh, Jen, who, Jen Ross, who are, is our super music supervisor. And they got a system very early in the process of clearing these songs way out in the outline stage so that the network couldn't come back or somebody couldn't come back in the script stage and say, oh, we don't want this song. Cause that of course would be a nightmare for everybody. Cause we are, once you clear the song you have to then produce the song. So our, our music uh, producer, Harvey Mason Jr goes away and makes magic once it's cleared. And, you know, very kindly, and I've said this many times in interviews, but it's really the golden nugget of the success for me on the show is that Austin allows me to be in those very early conversations in the outline stage with he and the writers. And we have dance concept meetings weeks and weeks and weeks out. So, you know, it's pretty funny sometimes I, Mary and Jane, I don't know if you know this, but like there's times where I have information in my head about where things are going in the musical numbers that you guys don't even know yet. And, and it's interesting to be in rehearsals sometimes, you know, and Mary will be like, oh, I'm singing this song, I didn't know. And I'm like, Austin, you gotta tell everybody what's happening so that we, we know where we're creating from. Cause a lot of the times, you know, we're, we're creating numbers without a script being written yet. Cause we have to. You know, that, that there's a process that takes a long time, as Mary said, you know, we don't just come in and go five, six, seven, eight, you know, we create together and that takes time. So, you know, working with Austin and his trust is everything and being able to, to kind of chime in in those early outline moments really set a strong foundation, I feel, for my department. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about whether the lockdown affected um, the storytelling that you actually developed for this season? Um, you know, how you worked with the other members of the creative team, like did the storytelling change or the shooting change because of lockdown? I mean, from, from my side, you know, I'm, I know it was very different behind the camera than it was in front of the camera. Um, I, I know Austin would be able to talk more about this, but I do know that there were times where you know, we were up in Canada and, and they had real strict rules, obviously, for safety for everybody about locations. So, mm -hmm. you know, things that he may have wanted to put at a certain location at a bar somewhere else or, uh, you know, a coffee shop somewhere else. I do know that he did have to write in some ways to, to keep everyone away from those positions. But 
I find personally that that becomes like a really great creative parameter to tell a different side of something. And I, you know, I, he's never said this, but I do think Maximo was kind of born out of that. And thank goodness Maximo was born because I think that space is so incredible. And that storyline to be able to kind of intersect these, these worlds was really important to season two. And Mary finally got to get out of the house and dance yeah. with Maximo at the end. Like it was so true. You know, it was like, that was the best Mary seeing you be able to be in Maximo dancing, you know, it was really lovely. Yeah, so I have my favorite episodes from season two. Um, they are, you know, often based around the stories that just kind of like quietly laid me to rest, you know, where I was like, I cannot believe they did this. But I also just love, um, some of the bigger numbers. And I'm thinking like specifically in, you know, episode one, this like huge Busby Berkeley type, you know, musical arrangement where I was just in awe of, of what you were able to do with this, you know, huge cast um, of performers. But I would love to hear from all of you, what were your favorite scenes or episodes this season? Um, I have a hard time picking favorites. Uh, you know, I, I'm asked sometimes, what my favorite musical numbers are from the show. And I could maybe name 10 that are like the ones that jump out to me. Um, but in terms of the season, you know, I think that we really got into a groove towards the end. Oh my God. I, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm good at answering this question because I'm like, <laughs> wait a second, what was episode nine? What was episode 11? Um, I really, I will say that when we watched the finale the other day, and it's also the most recent in my memory, I was really um, proud of what we did there. And I felt like the finale was a quintessential Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist episode and that, you know, one minute you're crying and then the next you're filled with joy. And I just, we ended you know, on a different note than what we ended in one. Season one, we ended with, which is just, so incredible and that was uh, a wake we were you know mourning the death of someone and then the end of episode or the end of season two is melt with you and it's a and it's a, a feeling of hope and joy and like love burst and I was just like god our show is so cool that you know we can deliver something so different but also is in in the in the world that we have created of fantastical reality heart song land <laughs> okay Mary what about you <laughs> Oh my God, there are so many. I love um, including um, including one that I was not in. I went uh, home a little uh, more. I, I missed two episodes so I could be with my family for Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas. And um, so I wasn't in the episode and I forget which number it is because I never remember numbers, but um, where John sings uh, I'm a black man in a white world. And Beautiful. Yeah. I, I mean, I just felt like, um, I just felt like that, that he was magnificent, first of all, as was everybody. And Mandy, everything you, you did in collaboration with, remind me. Luther, Luther Brown. Luther. Yeah. Yes. He, he did an amazing job and John, respected him so much and it, it, it just worked. Everything about it worked. And I thought it was such a beautiful episode. And I actually loved, you know, when we did come back together at the beginning of season one, no, there was no, there was nobody that could tell us what it was gonna be like to shoot in, co in COVID. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a single friend that could pave the way for me that I could call up and say, what's this gonna be like? I had friends calling me. I remember people calling me and saying, you're going to do it. What's it going to be like? What, what do you, what's a normal day, you know? And we were all a little bit terrified and um, the, you hadn't touched anybody. Nobody touched you for so long and you were not supposed to touch these people that you're playing in a family. And, and then, at one point, Jane and I had a scene together and Jane, I can't even remember if we were supposed to hug or not, but we had masks on and we just hugged each other and something just broke loose in both of us. And we were, 
it was like I didn't ever want to let go. You know, it was just, wow, how, how amazing to, to be next to somebody. And we'd been tested and tested and tested and everything else. So, um, uh, that, sorry, long answer to say that that song, Carry On, that the family first does together, which is such a true thing about what you go through when you lose somebody is you've got to carry on, you know? And, and it was just this, Mandy had this brilliant idea of just simply preparing a dinner and putting it on the table. And on the last note of the song, you sit down to eat together. And it was, every time I pulled out that chair, I, I was almost in tears because it was such a true thing. That's what I love about about our dance and about our music is that there's, it's true. It isn't about showing off, or, aren't we brilliant? Although so many of our cast members are brilliant, but it, it's, more, it's more important that it be true. And no one can figure that out better than Mandy Moore. Wow, thanks Mary. Jeez, Great. thank you. Mandy, what about you? What were some of your favorite scenes or episodes from the season two? Ebony, this is not fair. They are all my babies. <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy at the you know the end of the season. I think our tally's up to like 140, 145 numbers, and so it's tough. It's you know a little bit along with what Jane was saying. It's tough for me to really say that one is my favorite because I really each one comes from this place of like true creation, and I just love creating with this cast, but. If I had to choose something, uh, Mary kind of tipped me off. I just, I was so proud of episode six and working with Luther Brown. I, he, he's a choreographer that I, as soon as Austin told me the idea, kind of the episode and that we were gonna be tackling uh, racism in the workplace, I immediately, first of all said, I am not the person to lead this ship. I can't do this alone and I shouldn't do this alone. And I need to bring in, someone of color who understands this world because I'm not going to be able to create from a place that is authentic and true for this story. And um, luckily, Luther is one of my dearest friends in the world. And I called him. I was like, hey, I think this could be so cool. He doesn't come from the scripted world. He comes from more artists, tours, music videos. And mm -hmm. but I know he's really wanted to get into scripted. So it was a perfect opportunity. He came in and immediately we all just gelled as a team and to see him working with the cast, it just, I just had to step aside and let him do his beautiful work. And Black Men in a White World is truly a culmination of that collaboration between John, between Austin and the writers, between Anya, our director, Shasta DP, and us as a choreography team. You know, when we shot that that day, I thought, this is what's awesome about the show and television and the ability to tell stories through dance. And uh, yeah, for me, that number just, I go, okay, I can't believe we got to make that, you know, and that people got to see that and were very affected by it. Um, but then of course you've got Jane on drugs in the episode, you know, whatever that was. And we had so much fun in that number and just her being in the room with Noah and uh, Felix, it just, we had a really good time doing that number as well. And Mary with her pot tap dancing on her head, you know, <laughs> in episode nine, I, I just like, this can't be my job that we get to work and create these things together. And, you know, so sorry, Ebony, I can't give you my favorite. <laughs> And I love like the sense of joy um, that, that comes through when you talk about the, the creative possibilities of this show. I want to circle back to, um, to this episode that you're talking about where the character of Simon sings, I'm a black man in a white world. This is one of the things that I love about your show is how relentlessly honest and authentic it is. And one of the important things about that episode is that Jane, you know, you as Zoe have to confront that, you know, as someone says at the beginning um, of the season, everyone is dealing with something. The world has not stopped for you or your family, you know, even though Mitch has died, as much as you would like it to have stopped. And one of the things that you have to come face to face with is that your, your friend, you know, potential love interest, Simon, is dealing with being a black man in tech, but also just a black man in the world. And you're not gonna say the right things all the time. There are things that you're not gonna recognize. 
Can you talk a little bit about how you see storylines like that fitting into the larger landscape of the show? Um, uh, my, how I approached that episode was that I, I called John and I called Alex and I said, do you like this episode? <laughs> and if you do, what do you like about it? And if you don't, what don't you like about it? And how can I, uh, assist you in telling the most authentic version of this story? And so we had a lot of conversations about that privately. And then we had a lot of conversations with Austin and, um, you know, I just think it's like, I don't know, I think it was Mandy or you, Ebony, who just said something about authenticity or truth. And I felt it, that it was important for Zoe to be uh, flawed as um, many people are, many white people are, many white women are. And you know, not to make Zoe um, fix anything or be a hero in this story and to just uh, just try to be authentically wrong when she's wrong. And I, you know, I, I, this whole show, I think what we try to do uh, through heart songs, you know, this is the core of our show is like what people are actually going through is to, tell these stories as authentically as possible, whether it's about grief, uh, not grief, um, grief or postpartum depression or, um, you know, racism in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, as a, as a black woman watching that episode, you know, you kind of watch with your, um, holding your breath because you're so accustomed to, you know, the feelings of the white people in that scene being the emotional focus. And the fact that you let, you know, Simon and Mo and Tobin, you know, be the focus of their particular stories and be angry, be sad, be confused themselves about how to react. I just felt was such, you know, I hate to say brave, that's such an overused term, but so important um, and just really is a testament to the kind of show that Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist is um, as a whole. So... Can you talk, all of you, about, you know, what hopes do you have um, as you continue telling the stories of Zoe, of Maggie, of Simon, you know, Max, you know, the, the larger world here? What are you hoping to do as you go forward? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the thing that I've always loved about this concept is that it's limitless because I think humans are limitless with their evolution. You know, the, the way that we tell the story, you know, the way that Maggie feels yesterday is not going to be the way Maggie feels tomorrow because we as humans evolve. So, you know, for, for my world and the creation, I just hope that we can, we get a season three and we're able to continue tell the, telling the stories because humans are fascinating and they have so many sides to them and the relationships in their in their lives are complicated and i think that makes for really beautiful storytelling too because it's very multi-dimensional you know because not only do you have things that are kind of cultural things you may be talking about but it's also personal things so you get these kind of external and internal worlds that uh you know i think very seamlessly move between th you know throughout the storytelling in our show so i I just hope we get to do it again. I'm like, I wish they'd just pick us up. Come on now. Come on, let's get that news today, you know? <laughs> Come on, Hollywood. Jane and Mary, what about you? What sort of stories, or even, you know, songs? Are you secretly, Mary, hoping to do like a Cardi B track? Are you, you know? <laughs> Mandy knows I would. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also uh, not so secretly hoping to tap dance. Yes. And, and something really fun and hard that I can just, you know, um, go crazy on all summer to try to learn. But um, I have actually resisted some of the things that um, that Austin has said to me, like he said, you know, we want you to play both parts of anything you can do. I can do better. And I'm like, why can't I do a cool modern song? <laughs> and then I and then I ended up and I told Mandy at the get-go, I, I don't know how this is gonna work. And then of course, you know, because I admit 
that I'm wrong a lot. And, um, you know, I have four kids, so I spend my life admitting I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but um, I was wrong. And it was the most fun dance. And, um, and the other thing is, I do love Bernadette Peters, oh my Lord. And the first time they said, you're gonna have a song and dance this season with Bernadette Peters, my reaction was, no, please get her dancing with anyone but me because I can't do that. I, like she's a legend. I've sat in many a night in theaters watching her. I was doing a Broadway play that got out earlier than, than her play did. And I used to go catch the end of the second act where she and Marty Short, you know, um, in the Goodbye Girl, like every night. So when I'm supposed to sing and dance with her, my first reaction is no. And it ended up also being one of my favorite things. And it was Gwen Stefani, if I was a rich girl. And I had, I had so much joy in doing that because she's so remarkable and kind. You are <laughs> amazing, uh, Mary. Come on. It was so much fun. I, I, I really, I, I was driving to work and I, there's a church on the way to work and it had a sign that said, comparison is the thief of joy. And I really needed to hear that. It's like, what are you doing to yourself? Just go be grateful for this opportunity and go have fun with her. And I had so much fun. And um, so things like that, I would be excited to do. I so hope you get to do some of that. Jane, what about you? Um, I think it's really fun and really hard, but ultimately so gratifying is this process with Mandy and Austin that we all three do together and the rest of the cast. But, you know, the, for me, for seasons one and two, every musical number came out of Zoe's brain. And so this like mold of, uh, because I don't come from musical theater I, and I don't have a musical background. So this, this marriage between acting and dance, I mean, it sounds simple, like when I just say it like that, but it's really not, <laughs> especially like when you have three people who are like so committed to their, like Mandy is such an inspiration because she's so good at her job, but also she loves dance. Yeah. And I relate to that myself in terms of acting. Like I just love acting and I love talking about it. And we all like, I, I think that there's even more we can do. You know, we're, we're limited on time, especially with my time and maybe next season it'll change. I don't know, but I am excited to explore more like about transition between scene and song and transitions within the song and like there's just so much more we can do and we all are interested in that and you know I feel so lucky that I have to be a part of this process as well of like you know what why is this number coming out of Zoe why and and I just think that there's just it's ripe for creativity and I'm excited to see what else we get. I'm so excited I you know, as I said, I hope you get the news that season three has picked up four or five, six seasons in a movie, um, you know, right away, because I just love what you have all done, um, you know, to, to give us this incredibly rich world, just the incredibly grounded performances and what is an otherwise hugely fantastical, larger than life atmosphere is such a testament to, to all of your skill. Um, for my last question, um, let's just do a fun one here. Tell me, who is the member of the cast most likely to make you laugh and ruin a take? <laughs> because there are scenes where I'm like, there's no way I would have gotten through this. There's no way I would have gotten through this. The show is so funny. I mean, for me, Noah, he is so funny to me. I'm not in front of the camera, so th this is gonna be very different for Mary and Jane, but for me, sometimes Noah's delivery, I mean, all the cast has hysterical moments and also very like poignant, intimate moments. Obviously Mary and Jane is the same thing, but Noah came out of nowhere for me. I didn't know him. I didn't know anything. And the first day he showed up was the day that Jane did pressure. 
on the, the first time I worked with him, it was in season one. And I was like, how is this guy not losing it while Jane is going bananas up on this table? Like, who is this guy? So for me, Noah is like the guy that I can't keep it straight with him. <laughs> Jane, is there anyone you can't look at while they're performing because you'll, you'll just lose it? Okay, there's two answers to this, or there's a couple. One is I'm most unprofessional to breaking. I break all the time mm -hmm. I, I just two during a musical number I would not dare I'm like if I fuck up this take excuse my language for this actor who is like uh, really I, and, and for for the thing of for Bradley our camera operator and for the performer like what they are doing is so hard if I mess that up and I'm just standing there like it's straight to hell like right. that's not a, that's not okay um but I guess the person who actually makes me laugh the most is Skylar. Mm -hmm. I can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I Mary. Love it. Um well, Jane, when she's doing, Jane will sometimes enter a scene and it's it's almost always right at the very beginning of the scene with something so off the wall and wild and Jane like that that I use I often have to suppress the laugh. <laughs> Andrew Leeds, who plays um, my son, has a little scarily a uh, similar relationship with me in real life to, as to my son. <clears throat> my son uh, just only makes fun of me. He's just he <laughs> does it publicly on Twitter and things like yes, that. Yes, and, um, right. Yeah. And so Andrew Leeds is somehow taking a cue from that. And um, so sometimes, sometimes it's him. And um, I will say in my tiny brief moment of getting to dance with Jon Stewart, he and I both laughed at every single moment that we had together in Shake It Off, which no one sees us because the camera's not really, at least on me at that moment, but I laughed every single time. And I am I think I've been pretty good, pretty well behaved on this show because when I did Step Brothers, I literally see takes in the movie where I'm full on laughing, but right. I just think they figured you're not looking at me at that point so we'll leave it in or actually Adam McKay said we don't have any takes to go to that you're not laughing so I I've been pretty well behaved <laughs> I love it I love it thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation as I said like it is it is a show that you know offers such heart um and such an intimate peek into these fantastic people I I just can't say enough wonderful things about it and you know best of luck as we head further into Emmy season, but even beyond the awards, the accolades, I just want you to know how amazing this show is and how much we wish you every success as you as you go forward. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you. Thank you.